Larson is also laying the groundwork so that if the church takes a biblical position, this will be used to justify attacking the church for violating religious liberty. By screaming in all capital letters that this is too good and that it's a religious issue, he's preparing everyone's mind to revolt against any church decision because it will be seen as a violation of religious liberty. Another rebellion is about to pop off and church leaders have nobody to blame but themselves because the very arguments that they themselves have used to defend abortion will soon be turned against them. This waste of cyberspace just published this article right here screaming, our abortion guidelines are too good to replace exclamation point with all capital letters. David Larson is a professor of religion from guess where? That's right, Loma Linda. So I personally think that this is really encouraging because it shows that they are scared. However, if we take a moment to look through this article, you can see for yourself it's full of nonsense. The only thing wrong with our current guidelines on abortion is that not enough SDAs know about them. Well, surprise, it seems that the SDA abortion guidelines are not unknown except among our own church. Well, of course, because it is a matter of public record that church leaders have on multiple occasions for many years used so many deceptive, misleading euphemisms and have published so many false statements that members know nothing. And this was the goal from the beginning because if members knew what this meant, they would of course be furious. This year in January 2019, Adventist World right here ran the article by Mark Finley, misperceptions about the GC's compliance document. But the position on abortion has been far more misunderstood for over 49 years and never once were we given an explanation. Misperceptions are running rampant on social media. Oh my. Leader in the GC act all concerned when people on the internet begin questioning the document, but when the position on abortion has been questioned for decades, repeatedly, incessantly, they say absolutely nothing. You notice that? And what is the reason why? Because they don't want people to know what it really means. Notice something. Nowhere in any Adventist publication has any church leader ever, it has never been attempted to explain the meaning of the phrase mother's health because they all know exactly what it means. They complain that lay members don't know because they have never wanted anyone to know. I had nothing to do with writing them. I did a conference at Loma Linda in 1988 at which SDAs from all over the world presented a wide range of views on the subject. We published this in a 1992 book in an anthology which I edited with the title Abortion. I did not write the church's position on abortion, but I did write a whole book about it and the most well-known, the most well-known and most often cited presentation was George Gaynor's right here. But oh look, Guess what? Larson didn't include that in his book. Well, imagine that. How could that be? Is it because Gaynor's paper exposed all of the lies and the fraud and the greed and the cover up and Loma Linda couldn't afford to let that paper get out before church members? Do you see what he's doing right here? He is complaining that nobody knows about the guidelines, but he was the person who refused to publish Gaynor's paper, which would have, of course, helped everyone understand. Some say that our conference in our book prompted the general conference to take up the issue with a committee led by Dr. Albert Whiting. I do know that he received high praise from many who were members of it for his calm and fair even-handedness. Oh wait, this is the exact same committee stacked with Americans who they knew would be speaking for a church that was against abortion. And oh look, this was the exact same committee who constantly reminded themselves of the need to what? To protect the huge investment in our hospital system. with so many members, of course, connected to hospitals, this concern was never forgotten. And gentle reminders, those little gentle reminders were all that was necessary. Yes, please tell me again about being fair and even-handed. And oh wait, this is the exact same Albert Whiting who admitted in a letter right here that several hospitals, even after the guidelines were published, were still not following them. They were out of line and not following the guidelines, but let's not make that an issue. Let's just unite. Yeah, let's unite behind what's positive and what has been accepted. In other words, sit down and shut up. We already have our position. The hospitals don't even follow it, but don't worry about it because we have guidelines. This man knew exactly what was happening and yet did nothing. Gerald Winslow and others skillfully, oh, stop, stop right there. The devil is skillful, so being skillful means nothing. Represented a great number of us who hoped and prayed, well, praying people, <laughs> prayed for guidelines, which would be thoroughly biblical, avoided opposite extremes. There it is again. 
people in our church who support abortion constantly, they constantly try to pretend that we are neutral or balanced, avoiding opposite extremes. But this is not true because there is no neutral ground between life and death. Abortion is a life and death issue. Life and death are opposite extremes. This right here is just more word magic trying to confuse people. It is time to stop asking the question, when does human life begin? Oh, really? Says who? Who is this guy? Who is he to tell us to stop asking questions? A single sperm and a single ovum are alive and human. So this is really embarrassing because Larson is making the masturbation is mass murder argument, which again is very embarrassing because it is a blatant denial of scientific facts. Sperm and egg cells in themselves are not complete. If left alone, they will die after a few days, never developing into anything other than what they are. The sperm shares the genetic code of the man. The egg shares the genetic code of the woman. The main problem with Larson's statement is that it ignores the fundamental difference between a sperm and an egg prior to fertilization and the zygote which results through fertilization. And here it is right here from experts on embryology and biology. Human development begins when? At fertilization. Process during which a sperm unites with an ovum to form a single cell, the zygote. This highly specialized totipotent cell is the beginning of embryonic development. This is a fact that you can read about in any biology or embryology textbook, but what makes this even more bizarre is that Larson then says, so this is the result when the first fertilizes the second. So he denies this reality and then admits it. But in admitting that, he has a big problem because scientifically the zygote is now a complete living human being. This has, of course, undesirable for him theological implications, so he jumps from science to his philosophical woo-woo by claiming, wow, possibility and potentiality, not conception, but implantation is when the clock starts ticking for a new life. Again, says who? Are we now supposed to throw out over 100 years of understanding that life begins at conception because some guy in Loma Linda says so? And as always, he doesn't provide even a single shred of scientific evidence for this claim. He just makes the claim and wants all of us to accept it because he said so. The right question is about when new life becomes a citizen with the protection which all citizens enjoy. Oh, so now it's not about human life. It's about, <laughs> it's about when you become a citizen. Okay, sure. Our current guidelines are thoroughly biblical, although it is easy to miss them. <laughs> the biblical references are there. Oh, really? Why does the position on euthanasia have verses after every statement? Why does the position on euthanasia state right here in black and white that we are opposed to intentionally killing humans and quotes directly from the sixth commandment, but on abortion, this is all missing. You notice that? Yet the guidelines themselves are manifestly biblical, <laughs> even without the references. I can't believe they even write this stuff. The number one important question to ask is, well, what biblical principle distinguishes a baby born two months premature from a seven month fetus, making it a crime to kill the first, but merely an exercise of personal freedom to intentionally destroy the second? That is the critical question that in the, that is the critical question that enables these guidelines to be applicable, but they can't answer this question and no verse is given because it doesn't exist. This is all a complete fraud. It's just a bunch of woo-woo. Just a few months ago, I was at Loma Linda and I stood in Dr. David Larson's class and I asked both him and his entire class to answer this question and they offered nothing. They had no answer, no evidence because it doesn't even exist. Those of us who are SDAs believe that the body and soul are so integrated that they cannot be successfully separated. This means we should take into account what? The woman's psychological well-being as well as her physical, there's the word, her physical health. He says that the position is biblical but then says it's okay to destroy a child based on a woman's psychological well-being and of course provides zero Bible references because of course none exist. Single-minded thinking on issues like this makes no sense and helps no one. The irony of this statement is that people who want abortion do not like the Bible and claim that we need other voices. This is deeply ironic because the Bible was written over a period of 1,500 years by a very diverse group of authors who lived in very different times and geographical locations, and yet they all, all of them, unanimously and consistently defined the unborn as children, sons, babies, and brothers. This incredibly diverse group loved God, loved the scriptures, loved Jesus, all of them under inspiration 
creation defined the unborn as living human children, but according to people today, the Bible is too single-minded. And of course, no article on abortion by an Adventist would be complete without a heavy dose of hypocrisy and of course, telling people what to do. Therefore, we should, we should be against abortion, except, except in some very rare and difficult circumstances. This is amazing. We should be against abortion, but he never gives us a reason why. He never tells us why it could be wrong, and if it is wrong, what are the consequences? Amazingly, they never tell us that information, and as I've pointed out many times before, anyone who is familiar with abortion arguments can see that Larson is making a huge error by claiming that abortion is a matter of religious liberty and conscience, but then telling people we should be against it, he is claiming by definition that it's okay to be against someone's religious liberty, which by definition is contradictory to the Bible and everything that Adventists have ever taught and believed. If abortion is truly a matter of religious liberty, then you cannot have any restrictions any more than you can restrict a Hindu, Muslim, or Buddhist in their worship. If this is truly a religious issue, then you cannot tell a woman what she can or cannot do for any reason whatsoever. Larson is also laying the groundwork so that if the church takes a biblical position, this will be used to justify attacking the church for violating religious liberty by screaming in all capital letters that this is too good and that it's a religious issue. He's preparing everyone's mind to revolt against any church decision because it will be seen as a violation of religious liberty. Another rebellion is about to pop off and church leaders have no Nobody to blame but themselves because the very arguments that they themselves have used to defend abortion will soon be turned against them. The abortion issue, and let me just say in <laughs> little parenthesis here, we cannot be the conscience for someone else in this situation.